it's, it's a welcome new change across and I think good for all of us in the room that the kind of importance that it needs today. Yeah. Just to give you a few example of how visa and tax work together. Yeah. You all know in Bangalore and other locations when we try and go for a business visa or an employment visa, the kind of documentation that goes in. When we go for an FRRO registration in Bangalore, in other locations, there are different requirements. Yeah. If, if you end up asking for a visa extension in a different city, there are different requirements across. Yeah. But they have started asking for tax documentation along with it. Whether you pay with the tax proofs, whether you have paid provident fund, all those questions have started coming when you go for a visa extension. So unless somebody understands the nuances of tax, you may end up spoiling a good visa application or a vi good visa extension chances. Yeah. So it is very critical that th that amount of teaming, and it's, it's being visible now. If we say, no, it's only planning for deployments, it's not. It's even smaller things, getting the notifications, getting the tax documents in place. Yeah. One classical example, will, I think, which is coming across is when people are not taxable in India. Yeah. People take short stay exemptions in India when you are here for a shorter duration. But at the same time, you're asking for a visa extension. Yeah. The authorities have started asking for proof of payment of taxes in India, without which they do not extend your visas. Yeah. It's a problem because the employee is not taxable. You would not definitely not pay tax. So how do you satisfy the visa authorities that it is a case of short stay exemption? Yeah. That requires for us to have that basic understanding of tax to be able to go and have a debate with that officer to say why they are not taxable or be able to furnish some documentation supporting our argument. Hence, a good collaboration with whosoever is managing the taxes for these employees, it helps in the long run. Yeah. A any thoughts on this? A anything that you would want to address or share given your experience in the industry? Steve, would you want to add something on this? Have you seen this aspect of uh, problems at the FRRO or at uh, yeah, the and uh, many a time, Samarpal, you had helped us <laughs> in the past. Uh, so we, we had this issue where immigration was not talking to tax, and when the time for immigration renewals had come up, and um, uh, you remember that I had to go to Social Security office uh, for FRRO to argue with them uh, based on the law, exact reading of the law, and they they were not listening to us. So we had to remit the taxes, and we had to make sure uh, that only when we remit the taxes and the social securities uh, into um, the government exchequer, we could get uh, immigration extension. Right, right. And even the documentation has started getting linked. So the Indian income tax return form has a column to disclose your passport. So authorities are also trying to match their databases. We know at least uh, in some of the locations it's become quite automated. Once you apply for an FRO registration, your data is shared with the social security authorities so that they can track whether you are paying taxes, whether you are complying with the other laws in the country or not. Yeah. Hema, would you want to share some perspective? Yeah, so uh, this tax perspective is just not about, uh, you know, our uh, um, immigration activities, but even for your statutory compliances, like your provident fund in India and similar taxes is, is becoming a mandatory document now. If you're not able to show the proof, uh, then, you know, we are getting notices from various departments as well. So it's very, very important for us to understand the policies and also ensure that we comply with the policies and, you know, work as one centralized team like Jan mentioned. So just, just to give you a, a good snapshot of what all for an immigration professional could also be relevant to have basic understanding of what happens across the global mobility field. I'm not saying you can be a champion in all of these, but a basic understanding of how cross-border movements accept or how tax implications for a corporate impact you. Yeah. This will help you if you're doing any particular visa, any particular secondment, then, so I've been shown 15 minutes left, good, <laughs> thank you. So any secondment, any move, service tax, corporate tax, immigration, personal tax, a broad understanding of all these topics, I, I think is the ask in today's world for any good immigration professional. Yeah. So j just wanted to highlight that you, you need to keep, like Steve mentioned that you spend a lot of time actually doing all of this discussions with your other colleagues in an organization. Yeah. Because you end up on a decision making table where all these points will be put up. Yeah. 
So Hima, you want to share something? Do, uh, do you see any of these discussion coming to your table at any point or? Uh, or every point or? Yeah, every point, uh, yeah. but not such a theme together. Okay. So, okay. Uh, because what happens is today the way the profits are structured, right? They have specializations and the specializations are specific for their own areas or maybe they will know if you take the psychop, right, the previous one and the next output they would know. But uh, a holistic view, again, as I keep repeating, right, it has to come from a specialized group which actually runs across all these functions. And, and it has to, it shouldn't happen towards the back end, right? Like how he mentioned, right, when we start talking about a customer discussion, it has to happen at that stage in terms of who's going to go on a business visa, who's going to go on a L1 health plan. Yeah. This kind of discussions, you know, are more driven by what I have as people available in my list, rather than, okay, what is needed uh, from the customer side. Yeah. So if this happens, it will be very good, but I, I don't know how many companies it happens. Okay, okay. But See, the, the I, culture I is changing. Yeah. I mean, you have to change the culture now. Absolutely. So, so I, I think you said the right word. Uh, we all need to go on a journey to change if we want to be good professionals in whatever field we are. I think the change element is something that we, we're seeing across. Whatever you do, whichever team you move in, unless you have a broader understanding, it becomes difficult to gauge your way in today's corporate world. Yeah. Steve, would you want to share? I know you've tried to learn corporate tax and do other stuff. So w what's your take? Does it help to know all of this? Yeah, so uh, you never know who asks you what kind of question at what's in what circumstances. So while you may not be able to answer everything, at least you should know 10 basic points. What creates a PE? Very elementary question, uh, two, three points. Just talk about it and say we'll get, we'll refer you to the contacts person. Or if you, if somebody asks you, okay, what my tax rate is going to be, just know what it is going to be, and just elementary. Make sure that uh, see to get a seat on the table in the boardroom is not a mean task, honestly. That comes with you need to know a lot of things, uh, and it comes by reading, it comes by interacting with the professionals, and you've got a whole bunch here, one of the finest in the country, and. Um, need to keep learning there's, there's no alternative uh, you cannot go with half knowledge and say okay i don't know uh, and next time the managing director or the ceo sees you he doesn't have to ask you a question because he thinks you don't know uh, I, yeah, th yeah. that's my take no that's that's absolutely right i think uh, also while we may say that you need to work as a team work as a group there is always this other philosophy of that your performance goes down when you are not working in a silo and uh, just to, uh, since I talked about sound chamber, I think we should also talk about social loafing. <laughs> you know what social loafing is? <laughs> you know what social loafing is? Yeah, good, good, you don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> so very simply put, social loafing means that an individual performance drops when put in groups. Do you agree? Can it happen? Yep. Yeah? Can it happen? Because people tend to think more of what others are saying as compared to my own competency. So whenever you are put in a group, there is a tendency of social loafing as in your performance starts going down. Whatever task could be achieved by three people, if I make a team of six, they would actually do the same task. Yeah. So while we may think of creating different teams to do all of this, the more teams we create, I think the more self-realization of your own knowledge and the ability to team with others becomes very, very important. Yeah. So while we may say immigration, tax, social security, all are actually intertwined in today's world. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few more examples. We spoke about it and people who are in Bangalore would know that uh, the FRRO likes to change the documentation requirement with season change. Yeah? So <laughs> suddenly you will need a PAN, suddenly you may need a tax return copy, so those, those things happen. And our experience has been that the documentation is not standard across locations. Yeah? Some even simple things like some cities or some states are asking for an FRO registration even for a one day travel. Some are saying for a six months travel there is no need for taking an FRO. So there is ambiguity in the way each state is deciphering these FRO rules, specifically where there is no FRO office and for example you may end up in a police station for the FRO registration. There the only thumb of rule is whatever is asked just give, isn't it? is simpler that way. You would not want to sit and negotiate or discuss anything there. Yeah. So you have to be careful, understand the different requirements across cities. But whenever you are looking at 
inbounds or outbounds, I think the story continues to be the same. With the changing world, the documentation needs would change. Ima, have you had any experience on documentation, on anything that's come up as a surprise which you guys have not planned? And yeah, many times, especially when people go uh, through the immigration office and then, you know, they come back. Uh, now, you know, suddenly they ask for Aadhaar card, they ask for, you know, just statements, bank statements for the last mm. five years. And uh, we recently had a case where they wanted all the bank statements that we've been using for the last 10 years. So and nobody would have it actually. Yeah, nobody would even have that. So we do have those kind of things. And then, you know, we can't talk to the embassy, right? To mm. even ask why we would need those information. Correct. So Correct. We, we do have those non-standard requirements. And specifically when in, in the, even in the FRO office, they don't even uh, now allow an advisor to enter. Yeah. They just want the person to come in to take his registration. And yeah. then they ask all these difficult questions. And we don't even get to know the reason. Uh, yes. I mean, so. Yeah. See, anything from your side on the documentation per se? Have, have you seen yes. or is there any best practice that you could suggest? No, so th <laughs> this is where I fail completely. What worked one week ago may not work now. What worked in Bangalore will not work in Gurgaon. Uh, Gurgaon has a new cir circular for FRRO registration. So similarly, um, so I would say for, at least for India, don't write on your own, uh, get in touch with a professional because it changes within every jurisdiction. It changes uh, after uh, a set time, not even set, unset time. Yeah, so I, I would say that uh, don't go without frustration second time it becomes difficult. And I think our learning also has been uh, across uh, these kind of services is that please inform the assignee who's going for the FRRO that this happens. Yeah, Because they, they go with the feeling that I have to just go do the work and go and get my coffee. Yeah, And when you go there, you actually is hurting for dinner, I think, yeah. by the time <laughs> you come out of that uh, place. So education on how the process works, how much time it may take to do these applications, I, I think is a must. When, whenever you are preparing one of your assignees for this kind of a stuff, a consultant may do his job, but I think it's also important uh, to set the right expectation from the company side as an immigration requirement. I, I think we don't need to discuss that. All of you are strong immigration professionals and understand the consequences of non-compliance. Uh, I standing here would look stupid if I try to tell you what are the consequences of non-compliance. But uh, Hema, do any thoughts on how do companies perceive this threat of business visa versus employment visa? Is it really serious or are you seeing any change? Uh, I would say we've started to think about it, especially with uh, the, some of the statutory things that are already coming up. But if you ask me, uh, yeah, there are certain companies where, you know, they're blacklisted uh, for these kind of reasons. But I wouldn't say that uh, we are 100% compliant. Okay. Uh, we've definitely understood the need for doing that uh, and we are approaching some of the law firms to help us with uh, these kind of and, and our consulting partners as well. But uh, again, there's no rule, right, to mm. say that, okay, comply with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's always a surprise element to it. Yeah, yeah because so. the business may come up with a need which is you can't wait for an employment visa. That's the typical case where we see these kind of movements happening. Business right. wants people immediately. so. Whosoever has a business visa long term, 10 years, they please move first, we'll see what needs to be done. Yeah. And the other thing is if they go on a business visa, you really don't, <coughs> you're not able to track what they're doing there. Yeah. Are they sitting and attending meetings or are they learning something? I mean, uh, or doing some work, you will not be able to track. And US today has a 10 year multi entry. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're not really tracking uh, what they're doing within those 10 years that they are supposed to be out. I think you were mentioning a very important point because you're taking the argument to the next level. Normally we say tracking of employees is an issue. The point you are making is tracking of the activities done by the employees is an issue. Absolutely. Yeah? Because it's, it's the second level. Today we are developing technology or we have, like Shruti can talk about it, the technology tools that can track employees. But I think that's the real need and with, and, and I can share that from a tax perspective as the BEPS regulations are coming in, which is based erosion and profit sharing. This becomes absolutely critical as to the kind of work the employees are doing in different jurisdictions. Yeah. Now the test is not that how many days employees have been outside. The test is that what kind of work they do on a particular assignment. And in addition, if for example, if somebody marketing, is somebody signing a contract for you, 
is becoming very critical to track the kind of activities. So companies have started looking at an information requirement saying if you're going on this assignment, what will be your role to cover what kind of work will you do? Yeah. So it's a checklist which companies have started preparing saying we're sending you an assignment, look at these 10 parameters, these are the ones which you are allowed to do. Beyond this you need to come back and discuss with us. Yeah. Very critical to stick to that. Steve, would you want to add something? Yeah, exactly what uh, Hema pointed out. So the activity is difficult. Um, but I think once we start pushing, and I, I'm, I'm not saying that we've been able to do it for uh, across the company, but um, in most of the dangerous com places, we've been able to uh, restrict the business visa or the employment visa based on activities that they propose to say, do it. Uh, but do they do the right thing? I don't know. But to your point, I don't know. Hmm. There is no control or check on what they do. See, because yeah. your business visa requirements do not even come to the business industry. Yeah. It's more looked at as a, a team which helps us in a, you know, a filing of a work permit. Hmm. But they are not the decision makers in terms of whether this person needs a business visa or work permit or not. Yeah. So we'll have to enable that team to take all kinds of decisions. And today we were talking in the morning as well. Uh, you know, when you when you need a ticket to go abroad, at that stage you will have to have, you know, the global mobility yeah. team to say that yes, this ticket can be issued for this person for this work, and I certify that. And so what does happen in reality? I mean, you you just get an invite the letter. Person is flying out on this somebody. date. Can you help <laughs> process yeah. stuff quickly? Yeah. They just go yeah. with the invite letter, yeah. and and I've seen some cases where people just go without the invite letter as well because yeah. they need to travel from that point as well. You set the right expectations with the customer. I mean, today technology is available. You don't have to be in person. So I think I think before some statutory authorities catch us, it's better to comply with those things now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What I would say is, when in doubt, uh, get an employment visa. Yeah. yeah. If you're unsure, get an employment visa. Yeah. So that's you where Steve, I think the tax role comes in, because the moment you say somebody is going on an employment visa, the tax implication for the company as a corporate changes totally. It does, it does. So, so that's where the interplay between tax, you would want as a mobility professional that everybody goes on employment visa. Be yeah? compliant. Everybody does what is the right thing. Yeah. But uh, from a business perspective, that means what? That means you're going, picking up an employment outside or working for a company. That means the corporate has to report as an international transaction, move cost across. Sure. All those things come into play. Mobility so advisory committee. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you will have to balance maybe somewhere sure. and be able to, because I have seen if you play the mobility card too strong, saying no, 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 you can't travel, you you are seen as the no man or the no woman to say, okay, don't don't call this guy for the discussion. Yeah, We need somebody who has solutions, not problems. Yeah. And typically, uh, mobility guys are known to, like us, are, are said these guys will create more problems. Yeah, Because they're going to say, no, this won't happen, you will be, you will get into trouble if you do this. Okay, okay. With that, uh, with just five minutes uh, on the card, We'll talk about a little bit on being compliant with tax laws because it's equally important while you may say that what happens if somebody is not complying with the immigration laws. You send people on assignment, you give them the right visa, so you've done the right job. They land in a foreign country, they come back to India. What happens on the their taxes? Yeah. We, we saw today morning's, uh, today afternoon's presentation with notes and everything. You know, he introduced black money discussion happening, but but when you get your employees back, are they exposed to black money? Do you think by any logic can they be covered under Black Money Act when your employees come back from a foreign country? Can they be? Can they not be? Yeah. yeah. So so what what do we do as mobility professionals, as tax professionals, to ensure that they do the right reporting? Because anybody who's gone abroad, opened a bank account overseas, has any foreign income from overseas, if he does not disclose that in his personal tax return, he's directly liable under the Black Money Act. Yeah? And penalties can be very severe. For example, the starting penalty for non-disclosure is a million rupees. Yeah? A simple non-disclosure of foreign bank account in your tax return. So maybe if you've traveled, please look at your returns. Yeah? And you need to disclose that. If as professionals in your companies, you should create awareness on this, that we need, this was not the intended objective of the Black Money Act. The intended objective of what we saw happen last two days. Yeah? 
But unfortunately, people who travel overseas on employment have got captured due to this regulation. Because there is a thought process that Indian outbound population is not disclosing foreign income in India. That is creating a lot of discussion at the tax office, at the finance ministry saying how do we track people who go out and work. So all these changes into the return forms, into the various declarations that companies have to make. For example, any Indian company having foreign employees getting stock option have to do an RBI filing now. Yeah. You need to disclose what kind of stock options are being given. Somebody is tracking each and every detail. And at some point, the technology is so good now that if it doesn't match, it will throw automated notices to the company. Yeah. So we need to be careful, guide our people on whatever is applicable on the Black Money Act. If you have any questions on Black Money Act, you can put it on the slide or you can ask now. It's, it's better that we give you clear thought process on how it's applicable to your organizations. Yeah. I'll move to Hema and ask if you've heard anything on the employee compliances, Black Money, any thoughts in your organization? Uh, not so much, but okay. it's, it's more in terms of, you know, non-declared per diems and those kind of things. But yeah, th that's a full day topic. <laughs> non-declared per diem, <laughs> we can talk about it. But yeah, yeah but not, not Anything? Yeah, not so much action on black money. Okay. Okay. I know nobody is allowed to talk about black money when we talk about <laughs> as a company perspective, but yeah, I can speak about it. We, s we are seeing a lot of action happening across the industry on black money. There are notices that have been issued to companies yeah, in Bangalore, in Delhi till now, asking companies to explain why their employees are not disclosing foreign bank account details and whether companies have taken any steps to educate their employees on the same. Yeah. So that's actually happening in the industry right now. My time is out, so I'll ask for closing comments from my panelists and any questions from your side. Uh, Hima, we go with you. Any, any closing comments? Yeah, so. Uh